Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Boston. It's a pretty good time to be a controls engineer. With today's technology trends, the world has more things to control than ever before. Almost anything you can dream of, you can build these days. And this altogether is magnifying the impact that us in the room, control engineers, can make on the world. I have two stories to tell you today. Um, the, first is, is the, the first story is about the origins of MATLAB and controls. Danny sort of challenged uh, me to, to ask, ask to talk about that. Um, uh, and then along the journey since then, uh, industry ran into some trouble. And the second story is about a solution to that trouble uh, which arose that's called model-based design. And after that, I'd like to talk about some of the amazing trends that we're seeing out there today. I'd like to show how design tools are evolving to support them and share some of those, those amazing control applications we're seeing out there in industry right now. And then I'd like to leave you at the end with some challenges and some calls to action. So the origins of MATLAB. There was a movie that came out about a year and a half ago uh, called The Imitation Game. Who's, who's seen that movie? So some number of people. Great movie, strongly recommend it. Definitely sort of engineer and computer scientist is his hero, hero of World War II. Um, the film has prompted interest in this man. You recognize him? Of course, it's Alan Turn. The film discusses his work cracking the Enigma code machines. As kind of a sidelight, uh, the two lines of code, uh, the two lines of MATLAB code at the bottom, uh, completely uh, uh, perform the calculations associated that the Enigma machine did with its coding. So that's two lines of MATLAB to to, to perform the Enigma coding. The um, the first, these are matrix operations. Uh, the uh, R's at the bottom are uh, permutation matrices that transform the input character to the output character. At the top of the machine, you see four dials. Each of those is a permutation matrix. Uh, the P corresponds to the plug board, which is another permutation matrix. And so if you multiply all those together, and then at the bottom you use uh, matrix inverse and a couple more matrix multiplies, uh, that, that transforms the operation. One wonders whether Turing thought of the math this way when he was uh, working on these. Here's a picture of the mechanical calculator that, that uh, Turing helped create to crack the Enigma code. It wasn't quite a computer. It was missing some key elements like programmability and storage. Uh, Turing wrote this amazing paper in 1936 uh, proving the halting theorem. Who, anybody here read that paper? Who's seen that paper? A couple people, okay. Uh, this is an amazing paper, okay? He, as sort of an, well, he was proving the halting theorem in this paper. As kind of an aside, uh, he basically laid the theoretical foundation for computer science with this remarkable single line. The universal computing machine, it is possible to invent a single machine that's used to compute any computable sequence. Truly spectacular. You know, I, when, I, when I saw this, it was like seeing the Magna Carta for the first time, okay? I mean, this is really everything we do today in computing was in this remarkable few paragraphs in this one paper. Uh, and, and the Turing machine, which is the, uh, it actually can be built, and it's simply a tape, an infinite tape that can go back and forth, and you can read, write, and erase ones and zeros on that tape. And that, that architecture can, can, is the basis for all machines we use today. And, uh, and Turing really made that claim, and that's why he's known as the father of, of computer science. Turing proposed a project to the British National Physics Laboratory to build one of the first computers in the world. It was going to be called ACE, the Automatic Computing Engine. Uh, here's a, a paper he wrote about the time. Uh, wrote, he wrote around that time. It's called Rounding Off, Round Off Errors in Matrix Processes. Uh, this is uh, the table of contents for the paper. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. This, this, these, uh, this table of contents could be the table of contents in a numerical analysis course uh, you could take today. And so what's really interesting is that Turing was thinking about matrix computations. And also, essentially, matrix computations is what the computer was invented to do. That, that was a main uh, purpose of those things. It wasn't video games, it wasn't word processing, it wasn't all those things. It was really about matrix computations. Unfortunately, the management at his labs chose not to approve the building of the ACE, believing it was too ambitious. Jim Wilkinson was a junior colleague of Turing at the National Physics Lab. Jim was also interested in matrix computations and building computers, and the torch was passed from Turing to Jim Wilkinson. 
Uh, Jim led a project uh, that successfully built a scaled out version of the ACE, which is called the Pilot ACE. And this was one of the world's uh, earliest computers. Jim went on to continue this matrix computation bent, and uh, he, de he developed a lot of the fundamental algorithms in linear algebra. Uh, inverse, uh, single value decomposition, least squares, all of those. He did that over a period of years, which culminated in this handbook that he published in 1971 that, that had a lot of these algorithms uh, together. Cleve Moeller was a junior colleague of Jim Wilkinson. Cleve's interests were also matrix computation and numerical analysis. Uh, the torch was passed again here. Cleve um, went on to take the, the, the algorithms that Jim had created and his colleagues had created, and he created LINPAC, which along with a team of people. LINPAC was an organized collection of Fortran subroutines, all, all written in standard format, all in Fortran. Jim's stuff had been in Algol and all sorts of other languages. And this was, single, simple, uh, it was done by a team and it was, it was really ruggedized. If you invert a matrix or you, you fit a curve through data using almost any software today, whether it's Excel or uh, a JavaScript online, you're using algorithms from this library. They may have been recoded into, into many different languages, but essentially they come from this work. Now Cleve wanted to teach his students using these Fortran routines uh, in a class that he was teaching, but it wasn't supposed to be a programming class, and that's why he invented MATLAB, which was simple interactive access to that. Uh, so, uh, um, so I suppose that if you've collaborated with Cleve Moeller, or perhaps just used MATLAB, this means you have two, you in the room have two degrees of separation from Alan Turing, uh, and, and you know, back through these matrix calculations, uh, with matrix calculations being some of the reasons why computers were invented in the first place. So it's really a straight heritage here. Uh, this is kind of when I kind of emerged on the scenes. So I was a graduate student at Stanford around 1980. I was taking um, what was Kyleth's linear systems course and, and some other digital control courses at Stanford. And uh, we had to solve Riccati equations. Well, believe it or not, we had to punch cards, you know, at Stanford in 1980. Okay, there were many computers <laughs> and other computers, but the, but the state of computer control system design was, was not good. As a young graduate student, I learned um, the areas of mathematics that are important to control theory. Uh, these, of course, include linear algebra, particularly eigenvalues in the SVD. Um, to model dynamic systems, there were ordinary differential equations. Uh, there was the linear time invariant state space case and transfer function forms. Uh, there's, of course, the discrete time equivalent of the differential equations. This includes state space and transfer function form. Uh, it goes by names like digital filter and signal processing or ARMA if you're an economist. Also the, the FFT. So this short list of mathematics uh, is very important to the study and practice of controls and signal processing. They formed what you might call a set of golden equations. But we had to do this math with punch cards. In 1984, uh, from a different direction, there was the beginning of a significant uh, innovation megatrend, the birth of personal computers. Here's a picture of a young uh, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. The newspaper clipping shows the yearly personal sales of personal computers at that time it was about a million. To put it in perspective, that's less than a half a percent of the 300 million that are sold yearly these days. You know, so, so if I was in a room with this many people, um, if there are 300 people here, only one of you would use a PC when MATLAB first came out. Here's a list of the technology innovation trends around 1984, the PC. Floating point math built into chips. Interactive software instead of punch cards and Fortran. C and Unix. Windows systems. In 1984, uh, MathWorks was formed. We built on these technologies to introduce a new version of MATLAB for PC, Mac, and Unix. And we added the golden equations from controls and signal processing to that. The result was interactive engineering math on, on inexpensive personal computers. The golden equations of control and signal processing available for anybody to use easily. This is a picture of the first brochure where we introduced MATLAB uh, in, uh, in the PC in 1984. This is a favorite example of mine that I think captures the power of MATLAB. This is eight lines of MATLAB code that solves the linear quadratic optimal control problem. The, every, all the variables in this code are matrices. 
There was a Stanford PhD thesis in 1970 by Earl Hall that was thousands of lines of Fortran code to solve this problem. And so with MATLAB, the, the Stanford PhD thesis is reduced to about these eight lines of code. From 1984 to today, a most wonderful thing happened. This table shows the specs for a standard PC like Danny was talking about earlier in 1984. Here they are today. The increases in performances are, are actually really astonishing. I, I don't think you even realize, Danny, the, the changes here. So look at this, 60,000 times more memory, 100,000 times larger disk storage. At the end of the table, FLOP stands for floating point operations per second. That's the speed in operations per second of a matrix multiply in MATLAB. Since 1984, it's grown from 17 kiloflops to 50 billion flops. That's an incredible three million times faster than that first PC you used. Now, this amazing increase has been transformational in, in my business, which is making software for computer-aided control system design. It's made possible larger scale design, analysis, and modeling right at your fingertips on your desktop. The world back in the 70s uh, had no airbags, no anti-lock brakes, no cassettes. If you had a transistor in your car, it was in your radio. It wasn't anywhere else. And, and, and part of what's happened over this time interval is a transformation, for example, to the automobile of today that has 50 to 100 microcontrollers. They're in powertrain. They're in chassis systems. They're in safety systems. They're in convenience systems just throughout the automobile. A remarkable transformation over that time. During that transformation, however, um, over that time period, trouble emerged in industry. And to talk about that, I want to, I want to talk about traditional development process at the time. Traditional development process includes requirements, specifications, design, implementation, and test. Typically, the software algorithms, mechanical, and electrical components were separately designed. The traditional development process quickly ran into problems by the growth in software complexity that occurred over this time interval. The problems start with the walls that exist between stages. There's always a gap between what, what's written on paper and what's designed using the, this old process that industry was using. The separate design of components results in walls between these design flows until integration and test pulls them together at the end. And there's more. Requirements documents are difficult to analyze. Paper specs are, are inexact and almost always out of date. Physical prototypes are expensive. Think, for example, automobiles and airplanes. And worst of all, writing code is very expensive and, reduce, and introduces defects. And then, of course, testing finds them late in the process when they're harder to fix. So this is kind of the state of things uh, uh, when, when industry started to run into a problem. And there was more trouble. This culminated in, in, a, in a lot of recalls, uh, in missed shipping dates, and uh, a whole variety of issues in industry from all this sudden increase in complexity, increase of software that was being put into things. So trouble, more trouble, and then big trouble. Um, I think of the maiden flight of Ariane 5 as being iconic of the old ways of doing things. Uh, I'm going to show a video of this. How many have seen the video of the Ariane 5? A couple here. OK. So th this, I think, is one of the most famous uh, uh, software failures out there. Uh, this is the first flight of the Ariane 5. The previous vehicle had been the Ariane 4. And within 15 seconds after liftoff, this is what happens. OK. As a control engineer, you don't want to see that. OK, this is a $500 million uh, failure. W what happened here was um, they took the control system, uh, uh, the hardware and the software from the Ariane 4, and they moved it over to the Ariane 5 and bolted it on. Unfortunately, the Ariane 5 had much stronger rockets. And when the uh, rocket had, had greater horizontal motion uh, than the Ariane 4, and when the uh, thrusters went to gimbal, uh, to, to correct for some wind during takeoff, uh, the, uh, the processor overflowed. The fixed point computations overflowed. And when you wrap a, float, a fixed point variable, it doesn't, good things don't happen to your actuators, okay? And it quickly self-destructed. Now, I don't consider, while you could have written software to catch that, I don't consider this a particularly, uh, although it is a software defect, um, what happened is they, they, is they really didn't model and simulate it. It would have been easy to, to model this ahead of time and see that this condition could, was going to be caused. It was essentially a requirements failure, and that would have been easy to detect during simulation. Okay, now I'm going to move to the second part of my talk, which talks about the rise of model-based design 
uh, to help with these issues. And the solution to the trouble in industry really came in two parts. The first part is multi-domain system modeling. We can look at the evolution of modeling software. Uh, it began in the old days with textual ODE languages. Uh, uh, Simnon from Lund University was one of the originals that uh, started with that. And then the world moved to graphical block diagrams that, that handle control diagrams. But really the evolution that's needed to, to really model these systems correctly uh, is multi-domain multi systems modeling. And that's what I want to talk about. I'd like to take a look at the modeling domains, and I use the domain loosely here, uh, that such a concept requires to fully model a system. And there are six of them. The first domain is obvious. The system models need to include continuous time models. Uh, these are often used for plant modeling, environment modeling, analog elements. The second domain is discrete time controls. Uh, this enables digital control, image processing, video processing. The third domain is physical models. This includes electronics, mechanical linkages, hydraulics, fluids, thermal. Now these models are different than control diagrams because they have bi-directional flow on the diagram lines and they're simulated using differential algebraic equations. The physical models have become really important these days because of a big increase in the mechatronics in modern products. The fourth domain is state machine models. State chart notation describes control and mode logic like this diagram of an automobile power window controller. Uh, this type of mode lo load logic actually accounts for a large percentage of embedded software that you find in automobiles, airplanes, and, and other devices. The fifth domain is discrete event modeling. These modeling elements include messages, servers, queues, and it can be used to model computer networks and buses with network packet queues. These are important in cars with CAN buses and other types of, of uh, networks. The sixth and last domain is simply text-based code models. It turns out that some elements of system models are simply best described better with text code than with graphical models. The example here I'm showing right now is a model of an extended common filter, and it takes only 16 lines of MATLAB code. Uh, the common filter is most naturally described using textual matrix operations. There just isn't, if you make it graphical, it's not the thing, it's not, good things don't happen. Okay, I'd like to show you an example of all this working together. This example, um, okay, this is a picture of a wind turbine farm. And I'm gonna show you the multi-domain model of a wind turbine. So here's a multi-domain model of a single wind turbine. Uh, here are the blades. This is the nacelle, which is the compartment that holds everything but the blades. This is the tower. We even have a model of the electrical grid here. Here's the pitch controller, the yaw controller, and the main controller. This is the model of the wind, which is an input to the system. Let's open up the nacelle. Here we find a gear train. It's hard to see from back there, isn't it? Uh, a generator and actuator models. Uh, let's open up the wind input. The input will be a wind speed that ramps up and settles back down. We specify changes in wind direction in there. And then the power grid includes the transmission line. Uh, we can look now at the main controller. This is a state flow model that controls the turbine. It has separate modes of park, startup, generating, and braking. Here's the yaw controller. For this example, it's a simple PID controller. Okay, I want to show all this working together. It's multi-domain simulation, a lot, a lot going on there. We're going to run this at two times uh, speed. Uh, if you look in the upper left corner, uh, you can see the wind speed increasing. Uh, over on the right, you can see uh, the uh, angle of the uh, pitch command of the blades going into the wind, um, and then they're starting to control it. In the lower right, you can see the rotor speed. So you see it speeding up and eventually hitting 15 RPM. Uh, in the top, you can see the pitch controller now uh, working to maintain the speed despite the wind changes. In the upper left, you can see that the wind is changing, and in the lower left, you can see that the uh, nacelle is, is changing to point into the wind. In the upper, right, upper left, you see the uh, wind speed is starting to drop, and so the controller in the upper right starts to work hard to try to maintain the speed. And eventually, it gives up and puts on braking and, and, and feathers the, the, the uh, blades to the wind. So there's a lot going on there. You know, you, I, 
Uh, you guys may not have seen something as multi-domain. This was sort of purposely built with a whole bunch of domains all working at once to sort of demonstrate the concept. Most people use a subset of that, but this is an example of all those working. And um, the goal we have at MathWorks and been working on is, is to build a single modeling environment that can model the entire physical system, the mechanical, digital, the hardware, the software, the environment, the whole thing. And it requires all these different domains I'm talking about. And this has, been a, this has been a major quest of 25 years that we've had at the MathWorks. It's been the life's work of, of a big team of people to build this uh, uh, an environment that can simulate all these in, uh, together. The second part of the solution to troubles in industry was a process innovation. The traditional waterfall process was re replaced by a new process that we call model-based design. In model-based design, the model is the spec. It's executable. It results in an unambiguous specification. And you can start validation and test development immediately. You don't wait till the very end. Design is refined uh, iteratively. Uh, and this, re this allows you to do fast design exploration. You can try a lot of different ideas early on. You can optimize the design before you build it. And you can find, again, find flaws, flaws early. Here's one of the huge stages of model-based design. This is the idea of automatically generating code. And this eliminates hand coding. Um, that alone is a reason why many, many of the major industrial customers uh, use model-based design. In the automotive industry, uh, this saves billions of, literally billions of dollars in terms of uh, the cost, uh, taking cost out of the system of creating embedded software. Uh, and it completely eliminates hand code errors. The test and verification is done continuously. It doesn't wait till the end. It's all the way through the process. And this obviously allows you to detect areas earlier and implementations that work the first time when you go to the hardware. So the traditional process has been replaced by this new process called the model-based design workflow. I'd like to talk now about the impact in industry. Now, we're actually very lucky as control engineers because control is at the heart of important things. So if you see important things happening in the world of being built, you're probably going to find a control engineer there and some controls going on, okay? And so I've got some showcase examples of, of model-based design, but they're really showcase designs of the amazing part of thing of what automatic control is. Uh, this is a picture of me in the first Chevy Volt in the state of Massachusetts a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, the powertrain of the Volt, uh, the GM Volt, consists of an electric drive unit, lithium ion battery, electric generator, and some, um, a lot of control strategies. Uh, this quote from the development team at GM emphasizes the interdependencies between battery, electric drive, and engine that were really important to the overall design. And then it, here's a slide from GM themselves talking about how, how they've scaled up model-based design. Uh, in, in building their cars, they have models with millions of blocks. They release them every six weeks. They have hundreds of, and really thousands of engineers that are geographically dispersed around the globe. Um, and uh, so th this, this type of design you know, scales up pretty well. But small companies can use it too. Uh, Tesla, also in the automotive industry, um, they, had, they simulated hundreds of powertrain configurations without physical prototypes. Here's a quote from an engineer there. And, and it shows that model-based design was enabling and enabled a small company uh, to build a, a car that, at, a, at a company that would, did, just didn't have the resources to do this any other way. The aerospace is always a fun place to look for uh, showcase examples. The Joint Strike Fighter is the next generation US military aircraft program. It's a short takeoff and vertical landing airplane. You could look at the nozzle in the back. You can see that points down. And there's, a, there's right behind the pilot, there's a fan that points straight down under the ground. Uh, the main design was done a few years ago, um, and the, but the first aircraft carrier test was last year. This is an incredible controls problem. Uh, this is a so-called six degrees of freedom control problem. You're controlling the XYZ uh, coordinates as well as the pitch yaw and roll. You're also landing on a moving aircraft carrier as well. Uh, and uh, just, you know, Control of unstable systems is just always fun to watch, right? And so MBD was designed to, to uh, use to design and fully automatically code the flight control for this airplane. A second aerospace example model-based des uh, design is, is the Orion. The United States currently does not have the ability to launch humans into space. 
Orion is the next, planned, uh, next manned spacecraft for the US uh, to replace the space shuttle. It's intended to carry four to six astronauts. Uh, the first orbital Enron test flight was about a year and a half ago. And, and again, back to my premise, is at the core of interesting things you'll find control. And these things are, uh, are uh, success for control engineering. Um, as well as model-based design as a whole. Here's another, air, here's another aerospace application. Uh, uh, applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins uh, built the New Horizons spacecraft. Uh, this was model-based design for the GNC. And uh, this went on last year uh, to do a, a flyby of Pluto uh, and allowed humans to see what Pluto was for the first time in human history. Again, I look at these as remarkable success of the controls community. I mean, you know, the GNC is the heart of a spacecraft in my, in my mind, and, um, and so these are controls problems that are making these possible. Uh, here's a smaller applications. Uh, this is model-based design of neuroprosthetic arms at APL. First, uh, the control software is trained using a virtual model of the arm. The patient learns to control the arm just by thinking about it. There are sensors at the nerve ed endings that, on his body that pick up the signals sent by the brain. After training the control software, He's fitted with one of these arms. And so here's a bilateral amputee that has his life transformed by the fusion of sensing, computing, communications, and control. I, I didn't even know this was possible when I first saw this, this application um, uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, an example of what a small team can do uh, in, in building controls. Uh, I have a couple of examples in education, the impacts of model-based design. And one area in education that had a big impact is in the whole area of project-based learning and, and, um, and, and uh, engineering contests. All right, here's, here's a fun one. Uh, this is uh, the electric die wheel is used for fourth year capstone projects and research uh, at Adelaide University. And um, they, uh, so this is running without a controller. You can see it's basically unstable. It rocks a lot. You can, you can maneuver it, but it's really hard to control it. Step one on the projects is to drive the math equations of motion. Step two is they design a control system. Step three is they simulate it on the control systems on the model. And step four is they generate code and, you, and run it in real time as part of this project. And you can see it's nice and stable now. Now as these projects go, there's always a step five, which is showing off. And uh, so they're showing off on this particular project was to uh, stabilize this upside down as well and have some fun there. The, um, here's a comment from the professor at the university just pointing out that by, by the time you finish your project list, some of the be best students are, are, are really well on the way towards being senior, uh, seasoned controls engineers after making all this work. Um, here's another couple examples here. Um, at the Formula Student Germany competition, uh, there's 115 teams from 25 nations that compete in eight disciplines. The teams use model-based design to simulate strategies, analyze performance, design of experiments, and implement controllers. I wish my controls in graduate school was like that. Uh, this is RoboBoat. This is autonomous channel navigation, image processing, control. Uh, again, the students get obviously really into these things. You know, this is uh, an important technical trend. Uh, this is at TU Munich. Uh, students in this program design flight control systems, but then they fly them in a realistic flight simulator that the school has on their campus. And boy, what a great way to feel, feel con your control gains and your control designs, but to sit in a flight simulator and, and, and bring the thing in for a landing based on your control system. There's a meta impact of model-based design that I just want to mention. And the meta impact, the, the long terms and product development um, are towards more time on design and less in implementation as test. And that's a good trend. You know, design's the fun part. Who wants to do the implementation and test? And so this, this chart uh, in a study by Arthur Doodle, Little show, has shown the changes over time here. Mo uh, Model-based design is a velocity enabler in this trend, allowing you to spend less time on implementation and test. And this is an example from the automotive industry uh, where uh, in the past this was the breakdown by automaker and suppliers in terms of different stages of the development. And what happens today is the automaker is doing more design. Suppliers are doing just as much design as they've always done, but everybody wants to be in design because that, that's where the IP is, that's where the high ground is, that's where the innovation is occurring. And so model-based design has, has, made, has helped encourage this path that allow automakers to get back into doing more design than they've done in the past. 
The um, overall impact on model-based design uh, on industry has been to increase the math and algorithmic content in systems, uh, the, uh, derive innovation through early design iterations. Uh, one of the most important ones I've mentioned is eliminate hand coding. Uh, the quality improves, less defects, less recalls, because of the early verification and validation. It helps collaboration across disciplines, across development stages, and the result has been a dramatic change in the industry and how systems are designed, implemented, and tested. Now, one of the things that's interesting is MATLAB really came out of education, came out of universities. That's where it first got started, and the controls area first caught on. Model-based design actually started first in industry and was developed based on needs and use cases and, and requirements of industry, and then moved back into education as a tool that was useful there. So as a company, it's just interesting to us to see the sort of two platforms that were driven by from different origins. Okay, my final section of my talk, um, I would like to talk about some of the amazing trends today that we're seeing. Uh, and these trends are pretty powerful these days. Uh, they're going to affect the outcomes of companies and industries. Industry is actually racing frantically to keep up with some of the trends going on right now. Uh, I'm also going to show how some of the art, somehow the design tools are evolving to support these trends. And I'd also like to share some more amazing industry and education applications that, that we've been seeing associated with these trends. The first big trend I want to mention um, is software and algorithms and math and everything. We're really participating in the build out of software and everything in the world. By everything, I mean all devices. What's a device? Well, device is a washing machine, it's a refrigerator, your car, your car is a device. It has 30 to, to 100 uh, processors in it. Or the elevator in this hotel. You know, you guys been in the elevator in the hotel. I mean, that didn't exist two years ago. And so we're really participating in the put, uh, putting of, um, of software and everything. Uh, I've heard pe some people have said software is eating the world, okay. The um, fundamental enabler of the digital age is the transistor. The first one was made in 1947. Uh, there were 25 million trillion made in 2014. That's actually 30 billion for every human on the planet. And more transistors made in 2014 than every year up through 2011. Now there's more. There's actually been a huge surge in the last 15 years or so. There's an acceleration, even an explosion, in the growth of the transistors, as, as measured by companies like Intel. We're really heading towards software to find everything. So that's, that's really, in my mind, the, the, the biggest uh, trend there is going on these days. And this, of course, is leading to smarter systems, adaptive, autonomous, collaborative, multifunction. The, uh, you know, there's tracks of this conference that are focused on these particular aspects. Obviously, an, an enormous, uh, enormous change. If you look out into industry, a lot of this is, has happened in, you know, kind of three to five years, and, and everybody's executing hard on these trends right now. But you look at industry, it's amazing, okay? Uh, you have startup companies that are building um, flight vehicle, uh, launch vehicles that land vertically, and then both had their landings in the last year or so. You have internet companies that are getting into the aerospace business. Uh, you, have autom you have internet companies getting into the automotive business. You have them getting into auto and aero devices. Okay, um, we're seeing control engineers that are streaming from the larger companies to these newer companies and they're bringing their model-based design approaches along. Model-based design is aimed directly at the rapid development and short development cycles that these companies are targeting. And of course, there's a, you know, thousands and thousands of other applications uh, that are just all part of what's going on out there. Uh, trend number two is the Internet of Things. I'm not going to belabor this, but I did want to. There is an interesting model that I always like of when I when I heard about the Internet of Things. In the beginning of the 1800s, there's a good chance you lived your whole life uh, without ever leaving your village. And the first connectivity on the globe was transportation systems. That, uh, in, in that sort of hundred years, uh, locomotives, steamships, trains, automobiles, airplanes really connected all the places on the planet. Uh, the next, state, next level of connectivity was people connectivity. And this happened through mobile devices. And this is largely uh, Steve Jobs and, and his era. It's really pretty recently, the last 10 years, to literally connect every person on the planet. And that was the second wave. And now, of course, the, the big wave is to connect all the things on the planet. So it's, uh, I, I always think of this as a good context for understanding that. Now, uh, we at MathWorks, from the standpoint of looking at controls uh, and, and software and tools, we think of the Internet, thing as, Internet of Things as having three parts. Uh, smart connected devices are the things on the Internet. 
of things. They often operate autonomously, they feed information back to the cloud, and they do some local closed loop control and, and data reduction. Exploratory analysis are the tools for gaining insight into the data after it's been collected. And then you have IoT platforms, and those are in the cloud, and they collect, organize, and store the data from the devices. So the missing piece for model-based design has been the IoT platform. Uh, so we've recently introduced an IoT cloud we called ThingSpeak uh, to support IoT applications in model-based design. And this is a, a cloud that allows you, uh, an application that allows you to collect data from devices, you can analyze them, uh, you can write, mat, upload MATLAB scripts, and then you can take action on them. You can exert control actions uh, there. Uh, and, uh, and so this is meant to sort of complete the IoT connection to model-based design. The third big trend that, that's happened in, in the last uh, couple of years has been in the growth of low-cost embedded processors and experiment hardware. Uh, uh, and this is the Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Lego Mindstorms. The, you know, these are not more than a few years old. Uh, also drones and other low-cost experiments. It's really quite spectacular uh, how quickly these have jumped onto the scene, scene and created maker communities and things like that. Uh, at MathWorks, we created hardware support packages for, for, uh, to support model-based design through MATLAB and Simulink. Uh, we have 170 packages today that are essentially each one of them is a toolbox that allows you to program these devices, things like the iPhone or the Raspberry Pi, without knowing anything about those devices. It's just a familiar li library of functions you can call. It allows you to get, a, get run, connected and running quickly. And, and we've, see, we've seen really exponential growth. Uh, there was over 300,000 uh, downloads uh, in the last year. And, and this, this curve here really shows the growth of these hardware devices from, from sort of almost not existing just three, four years ago to the amount of use that they're getting around the world today. These are being used as part of the design competition in robotics. Uh, this is an application for Lego Mindstorms uh, where you can use Simulink blocks, model-based design blocks to, uh, to do uh, edge following. These are used in design competitions uh, all around the world. Um, here's one, for example, uh, ET Robocon in Tokyo. Uh, here at ACC, the, the MathWorks exhibit downstairs will have a small scale version of this contest if you're interested to try your hand out at, at uh, designing uh, uh, a controller in, in just a few minutes. Fourth mega trend that's important to the world um, is uh, the growth of apps. Now, here's a model for thinking about apps. Um, the first platform was the mainframe uh, platform, uh, and that had millions of users and thousands of applications. The second major platform in history was, was the PC. That's the one um, that Danny uh, talks about. That had hundreds of millions of users and tens of thousands of applications. The world's now on the third platform. Uh, this is cloud, mobile, browser-based applications. And this has billions of users and millions of apps. Uh, MathWorks was founded on the second platform, Megatrend, and now the whole world and everybody is, is working to build out the third platform. The, the controls community has always had a lot of different apps, a lot of different toolboxes. Um, at, Math, at MathWorks, as part of model-based design, we've taken some steps to try to make it uh, easier uh, to build apps. We've built a place on the tool strip uh, that allows you easy access to the apps. We've pr produced a uh, much uh, improved the, the way you design and, and build them. The, um, uh, and of course, you can, sh you can create and share uh, those apps on the file exchange. I want to give you an example of an app here um, and, and show you some of the power of this. Uh, the example app I want to show is the uh, control is, is called the Control System du Tuner. And this is going to do H infinity synthesis. Now, um, the, um, to motivate this, uh, the, the world this, this is a picture of the world as a robust control theorist like to see it in terms of the mathematics. However, the real world is messy. The engineer looks at his screen and sees a, bl a block diagram like this, and it says, "How the heck do I tune that using H infinity?" Now. This chart here uh, shows the flexibility versus tractability of some of the popular uh, synthesis methods in control. Uh, and so it's tractability versus flexibility. Obviously, the goal would be that blue, rib blue ribbon on the upper right. Uh, uh, but you can see existing methods uh, you know, tend to fall in the different corners, with the generic optimization in the lower right corner being the brute force method. Uh, through some work by Pascal Gainet and Pierre Apkarian, uh, they introduced a new concept called structured H infinity synthesis. They really invented this new approach. I uh, published a, a paper on that a few years ago. And so that's what I want to talk about. Uh, uh, Pascal built a control system tuner app 
uh, that uses this fixed structured H infinity uh, loop shaping algorithm. And this app, uh, it tunes a controller in Simulink. It goes through five different steps. Uh, you specify the blocks you want to tune, specify the goals, you do the synthesis, and then you can visualize the results and update the parameters back to, to Simulink. And uh, so what I'm going to show you here is H infinity control in 60 seconds. That's what a good app should do, right? Allow you to do this quickly. So you're going to have to watch closely because this moves pretty quickly. But, but here we have a Simulink model of a DC motor, and we want to control the motor speed. And we have a step response goal and a loop shape goal. Okay, here we go. Here's the model. These are the two blocks that we want to tune. We go up here and we run the simulation. We look at the response, and you can see extremely poor response to that step input from that. We now go up here and we select uh, the, uh, the tuner app, and uh, we go in here and we specify uh, the blocks we're going to select. Uh, then we go up there to the top again, and we choose uh, the, the uh, step response goal, which what the inputs are, the outputs are, that, that that's going to happen over. We specify the time constant. Uh, then we go up and we uh, select a loop shape goal. Uh, again, specify where the loop will run from in the model and to. Uh, and then we can specify uh, the, the uh, crossover frequency of that. And then here's, here's how that looks uh, in the frequency domain. Then we run the synthesis. That just takes a, a few seconds on today's modern computers. Uh, we can upload the model, and we can uh, run it again. And there you see uh, much improved step response and, and, and overall disturbance rejection as well. So, so here, here you have H infinity control in, in 60 seconds. That, that's the goal of apps, to make something easy to use uh, in a practical way for, for an engineer. Now, um, this method, um, of uh, uh, H-infinity, uh, structure H-infinity was actually used recently, or fairly recently, on the Rosetta spacecraft. Uh, this is a mission to orbit uh, Comet 67P. Uh, it, it was on a 10-year trip, and it woke after three years of hibernation. And there were problems that it, that it had encountered on that mission. Uh, it lost some efficiency in one of the thrusters. The, the flexible modes in the solar panels were, were not being controlled that well. And so, they retuned the controller prior to the encounter to cope better with these problems. And they used the structured H infinity uh, in the robust control toolbox that Pierre and, and Pascal worked on. And the redesigned controls were uploaded to Rosetta in the May of 2014, and the test maneuver confirmed that the better performance was achieved. This went on to uh, perform some braking maneuvers, entered orbit around the comet, and, and they had a probe that landed on the comet. And this resulted in this picture of a comet. And if, you know, I, I look at this and I say, this is a cell, humans have never seen this before. Who's a, you know, humans have never seen a comet up close. This is the first picture humanity's ever seen. And I look at this and I, and I say, triumph of H-infinity control. You know, here's a control engineer at the core of this problem. And you know, here, here's H-infinity co contributing directly to important problems that are, are useful by humanity. Uh, postscript to this, they're actually attempting to land the Rosetta orbiter on the comet in December. Uh, in September of this year. Uh, by I put quotes around land because, you know, it, they're going to actually crash into the comet. But because the orbit isn't that fast and the gravity's not that strong, they think it might survive the crash. And they're hoping they can get some other telemetry once they crash it. So, so let, we all should look forward in September to see how that goes. Uh, number five, uh, data analytics. M machine learning and big data are broad megatrends, but it's particularly interesting to see how they're being used and applied to control systems. Here's an example of a company in Australia called Building IQ, uh, and they're using uh, MATLAB to develop adaptive heating control systems for, actually, say, model-based design, develop adaptive heating and cooling systems for office buildings. And uh, you know what, what I have here is sort of the traditional control um, uh, using um, the buildings use, and but they're going to factor in uh, the, specifically the comfort of the occupants. They're going to look at the, the time of use of energy prices and demand response, and also factor in the weather. And then they're going to run an optimization program up in the cloud to help uh, perform all this control. And so they move from the old way, where a set point is changed twice per day, uh, to the new way, uh, using all of that uh, controls, uh, where, where there is an adaptive set point. And uh, this has achieved a 25% reduction in cost. And again, this is a small startup company uh, putting software and things, figuring out how to do this stuff. 
Uh, trend number six uh, uh, that you know everybody in this, many people in this room are working on is, of course, robotics and autonomous systems. I have an example here of autonomous emergency braking of a truck. Um, and this is done by Scania. They use model-based design, sensor fusion, big data, and machine learning. Uh, in this design, they fuse radar and camera data together. But they start with 80 terabyte of video and radar uh, data from the vehicle logs, and then they use machine learning to develop fusion algorithms uh, for situation detection. And based on that, they create a predictive model they put into the vehicle. Uh, and here's a, a short, a very short video clip of uh, them testing out their um, collision avoidance system. Now, as a driver who drives on the highways with trucks behind me, I hope every truck gets this thing installed. So, uh, two more short examples of autonomous systems uh, seen out there. Aurora Centaur is building a pilot optional aircraft. So you could buy an airplane that sometimes you flew yourself, sometimes you'd uh, it would fly autonomously. And um, here's my favorite part. You still have to have the ground person waving to the uh, airplane to get it started. Um, uh, but if you look inside the plane, you can see there's actually nobody sitting there. It's just a camera. And, and so here's the uh, pilot optional airplane taking off. You can see the sticks being controlled by robotic arms there. Uh, if you were a passenger, you'd be sitting in the back of the airplane while this thing is being flown. And then it's being brought in for a landing. So the, this is built today. And again, relatively small company able to do this. Uh, um, here's another example. Uh, Yamaha has built something called Motobot, where they've slapped a robot on top of a motorcycle and are making it uh, drive the motorcycle. Uh, it's a pretty mean-looking device until you see the training wheels. Then it's not quite so scary. So, and so these are. This is so. It's just crazy out there. The stuff that's going on. You know, er every month we see something new that amazes us in terms of customer applications on these things. <laughs> Here's a university example. Maybe some of you have seen this. Who's seen the, the RoboCup videos and things like that? A couple, okay, a fair number here. Okay, RoboCup is a robotics competition whose goal by 2050 is to beat a, a human soccer team from the World Cup in soccer. And uh, here's the TU Eindhoven uh, team. Uh, they're in the middle-sized division. And this is just an amazing controls problem. They're using controls, vision, autonomous systems, collaborative, strat collaborative. there's also strategy. It's, it's soccer after all. And this is done by students using model-based design tools. It's really impressive what, what they're doing here, and, and it's a very, very competitive environment. Now, the team has, has advantages with model-based design, because they can do uh, design adjustments between games. In fact, they can regenerate the c controls code if they want to, you know, right in between games. Uh, and uh, this Eindhoven team is particularly good and has had a series of top finishes over the last several years. Okay, so here's the, total, the six trends that I talked about. Um, these are important megatrends that we all need to respond to. They're pretty big waves. You know, many, most of them should be familiar, but, but um, they're important. They're important uh, for most companies these days. Many executives are running hard to keep up with these things at all sorts, all sorts of industries. Um, they're important to industry, they're important to the controls community, important to tool vendors like MathWorks. We have to be aware of these, taking actions uh, on them. So the key ideas of my talk, uh, the first one, I have three of them. The first one is MATLAB emerged from the numerical analysis community and really the beginnings of computing. Uh, it was first adopted widely by, uh, uh, and, uh, by, by Danny and, and his friends <laughs> uh, in the controls community because it was so good at, at matrix matrices and control community had a lot of matrices with the state-space formulation. Uh, second key idea is the multi-domain uh, system modeling and model-based design starting from industry, really transform how the development of complex systems are done, but also project-based learning and research at universities. And the third one is there's just amazing technology megatrends over the last several years. Um, and the, uh, the combination of that with uh, design automation directly from mathematics is just magnifying the impact of everybody in this room uh, with, and accelerating the number of controls applications in the world. So in summary, we're, I think we're in the middle of a really exciting time. Uh, the current technology trends are just outstanding for control applications. There's incredible in robotics and other projects happening at universities, talks at this conference. Um, there's actually an explosion of innovation and small-scale development that's leading to startup companies and transforming existing industries from all of this. Universities have turned out to be the seedbed of this next wave of development and economic growth that's happening worldwide. Um, 
you also can use design automation software to work at the math model level and push a button to generate working implementations without coding. So everything is kind of combining here to extend the reach of control engineering uh, and magnify the impact of, uh, that we have in this room on the world. Now, just to be clear, controversial, I've got some calls to action. I thought I'd be specific on some ideas for you. Um, and uh, so these are just, I have a couple of ideas here. Add a project to your course loading low cost, low cost hardware like Arduino or something. Organize a student design competition. Become a maker, build your own IoT application in the cloud. It's not that hard. Apply advanced algorithms to real hardware and invent something new and start a company. Everybody seems to be doing it. Create an app that allows others to easily apply your theory. Uh, research new techniques for model-based verification and other capabilities that industry is desperate for. Or, and, and most of you are doing this already, uh, 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 but it's really important to be researched for some of the control technologies associated with these megatrends uh, that are happening today. So these actions are, um, are, are all motivated by technology megatrends. They're also actions that model-based design tools are specifically designed to accelerate. So we've come a long way from punch cards for computer-aided control system design. Thank you for listening. <laughs>